The Indian culture has a long tradition of education, whether it's the formal education or whether it's informal education. And it becomes essential to understand how the education has been developing, how the teacher's role has been changing over time. In ancient times, education was considered as a process of self-improvement, which continued from birth till death. At primary stage, it was considered as an education of living life, learning to perform the routine activities of day-to-day -day life. And hence, it might not have been thought of as a separate stage of formal education. However, it was considered as a preparation to life, as a preparation for life. When you are preparing for all the different roles which you are going to play in the future life, you are preparing for them in the primary stage of education. During those times, knowledge was considered as a third eye, giving insights to all the affairs of life. As previously said, it was considered as a third eye, which is giving an insight into all the affairs of life. So, you are not just having a preliminary glance of the thing, you are getting into the in-depth of the thing. You are understanding the logic behind the day-to-day -day activities which you are carrying. Once you have the logic, obviously you are going to perform better. How the Indian education was aiming at? What were the aims of Indian education? The spirituality, the character building, the personality development the civic sense, promoting efficiency, preservation and propagation of culture. These were the set goals and aims of education. And all the other activities used to revolve around these because the aim of education was set. Now, once you know that the aim of education is personality development, so the curriculum was planned in that manner that the curriculum development or the personality development was enhanced on the part of the individual. In those days, Education was considered as a lifelong continuous process of self-improvement. So, please understand here, it was a lifelong continuous process. It wasn't something which would stop at class 12th or which would stop at certain years of life. It was considered as a continuous process and the aim was self-improvement. Further, it was considered as a source for harmonious progressive development of physical, mental, intellectual and spiritual capabilities of the student to live as a useful citizen and make progress in the present as well as in the future life. So, the aim of education wasn't limited to the present life of the individual, it extended to the future life of the individual as well. Now, let's understand what kind of education system did the ancient India have. Ancient India had a Gurukul system. The student was required to stay with the Guru for the specified period of study. Guru's ashram was a kind of boarding school if we compare it in the present context. Everyone, irrespective of the richness or the higher status, they lived together, they were treated same. Even the princes of the kingdoms used to stay in the same setup where other individuals were staying. And they would stay as poor in the Gurukul. Like we all have heard of the story of Krishna and Sudama. Education in Gurukul was supposed to be free. But yes, there were different systems to support the Gurukul because definitely there was cost, but the cost wasn't incurred from the students. So, to support the Gurukul, everyone had to beg alms, Madhukari, as it was called during that time. Now, what was the purpose of this Madhukari? This Madhukari or begging alms was fixed for everybody, every child in the Gurukul. So, whether the child is from the upper class or whether the child is of a king or whether the child belonged to somebody who was from a lower social background. Because Madhukari was expected to teach them humility and a certain kind of in-depthness to the society for supporting them as a student. Also, it helped in minimizing the caste hierarchy and treating all the students as equal. So, one understands if everybody is going out to beg Everybody is going out to beg for arms. So, it was giving a certain kind of equality among all the children, irrespective of the background they are coming from, irrespective of the lineage they are carrying. So, Madhukari helped in maintaining this caste, helped in absolving this caste hierarchy. Now, let's come to the further conclusion of the things, whether who was the Guru. Guru was the head of the Gurukul. He was like a father figure. He was like a parent. He was like a guardian of the inmates. He taught students without charging any kind of fees. Now, this flows from how the Gurukul was working. We said that Gurukul was not supposed to charge anything. The similar was happening for the Guru who was the head of the Gurukul that they were not charging anything. They were not charging any kind of fees 
from the students but how do they manage the things then for guru charging fees was like a taboo he wasn't considered good if he was charging any kind of fee from the students a guru would consider vidya daan as the best daan and they would condemn the very idea of selling knowledge so it was considered that knowledge is something which cannot be sold so it is the prerogative of the gurukul that they won't charge anything from the students now how did they support themselves the gurukuls were supported by the donations donations from the kings there were donations from the philanthropist and the donations from the rich of the society further they would get guru dakshana from the students once they have completed the education now what was this guru dakshana guru dakshana was an offering of the student as a parting gift to the gurukul at the end of the study it need not be in the form of money it can be in any other form the way the guru desires it may be in the form of certain vices which the student would drop in it would be in the form of certain pledges which the student may take so all these donations and guru dakshana was enough to support the ashram and inmates as they practiced austerity and there wasn't any kind of accumulation of wealth in fact accumulation of wealth was not permitted at all on the part of the guru only a real scholar a proven master a spiritually enlightened person was recognized appointed and respected as guru so anybody could not have desired and become a guru they need to have certain qualities among themselves only then they could take the shape or they could take the form of a guru so the person needs to be honest the person needs to be spiritually enlightened only then the person can be appointed and respected as a guru as you know india has a very old tradition of guru shishya parampara for his selfless service the teacher or the guru was held in very high esteem by the society and was respected even by the kings kings means the rulers of the society even the kings used to respect gurus a lot a guru was revered more than parents and enjoyed a unique status even higher than that of the gods gods guru brahma guru vishnu guru devo maheshwara guru sakshat param brahma tasmay shri guruve narma so that says in itself that guru was even higher than the god different scriptures have been talking about this importance of god in other some other other kind of phrases so they have been shlokas like guru govind do khade kake lagu pae bali hari guru aapne govind dio milaye so in all these shlokas you can see that this god was secondary when it comes to the god a uh, guru because it was guru who was making the individuals reach to the god the guru was considered as an epitome of good qualities of both head heart and hand so he is going to have good qualities of head heart and hand he would have qualities of spirituality he would have in depth knowledge about the whole society he would have a scholarship to himself a true teacher was supposed to be a student till the end of his life so it's something like the concept of l3 teacher as we have these days a lifelong learner now if you see the present system of education and present connotations which are attached to the teacher there are many of them who are flowing from the ancient concept of the guru so this lifelong teacher even rabindranath tagore has talked about the same he said that a teacher gives knowledge only the teacher only till the teacher is burning himself or herself so he has compared guru to a candle a candle gives knowledge only till it is burning so it was same for the guru he was like a lifelong learner he was a guide by the side and not the sage on the stage that was the difference between a guru and a sage a sage is somebody who is sitting on the stage and is giving his directions from there but guru was supposed to be a guide who was always by your side that was the essential difference between the two gurus were supposed to be an institution by themselves they were famous for their scholarship they were famous for their sacrifices the students all over the world would get attracted to certain gurus or would get attracted to the reputed gurus in india india was considered to be the epitome of knowledge india was considered to be the homeland of these kind of gurus when the number of students were large the gurus 
would involve senior or brilliant students in the management of the teaching learning process. See how it happened because there were a limited number of gurus but eventually as the population grew and as the awareness grew there were a number of people who were coming to these gurus for education. So it wasn't possible for guru always to cater to all the individuals who are coming to his gurukul for education. So what guru would do is guru would teach his senior or brilliant students and they would manage the further teaching learning process. Everything wasn't left on these senior or brilliant students. However, the guru would always be there to guide these people, but they would help in management of teaching learning process. Now, how did this help? This provided the much needed assistance to guru in his work. This was something which was very much needed because the number of children who were coming or the number of learning knowledge seekers who were coming to the gurukul was getting increased and there were a limited number of gurus. So this kind of assistance when was provided by the senior students or when was provided by the brilliant students that would ease the burden on the teacher or the guru and they would get this assistance from these uh, children. Further, it also provided a certain kind of teacher training opportunity to these uh, young learners. So in within the setting of the system, within the setting of the gurukul, as learners also, they were getting this opportunity to get teacher training also. They also got the opportunity for learning the art of teaching to the prospective teachers under the direct supervision of guru. This is very different from the kind of teacher training system we have these days. Here, you do not get this offhand or onhand experience directly. However, in that system of gurukul, under the direct supervision of guru, you were managing this teaching learning process. Now, when you were getting that kind of opportunity, it helped the student a lot because the guru was in direct touch with the student. So, they would monitor them, they would tell them, they would improve them and definitely the product was a better one. Now, this monitorial system is a contribution of ancient Indian education system to induct the pupils. The ancient education system had this monitorial system wherein the guru would train the pupils, the senior pupils and these senior pupils would train the junior students or the new students who were coming into the system. They could be either the son of the teacher or older senior abler students as teacher. So it wasn't necessary that these young brilliant children of the teachers, they may be the children of the teachers and they may be the senior abler students also. Later, during Manu's period, the social order changed. Now, it was that anyone who is born as a Brahmin would become a Guru, whether scholarly or not. So, here the caste system came into effect. If you are a Brahmin, you are born to a Brahmin, you are going to become a Guru, whether you are scholarly or not. So, your occupation was certainly attached to the lineage which you are carrying. Occupation was attached to the family in which you are born. Occupation was attached to the caste in which you were born. The father will teach and train the son as a teacher. Teaching almost became like a family profession of the Brahmins only. Now this was not what the ancient education system or this was not what the monitorial system had perceived. They were talking of the abler students, the senior students, the students who were deserving enough, the students had those capabilities of a teacher. They were the ones who were trained and they were the ones who were given the responsibilities. But when it came to the Manu spirit, things changed and teaching almost became a profession of the Brahmins only. So the other caste people weren't allowed to become gurus. Now let's move further. What are the different rules and responsibilities which were expected of a guru? In those days, Guru had to perform a variety of roles for the students. He was a parent to the children. He was a teacher to the children. He was a scholar to the students. He was a missionary to the students. He was a friend, a philosopher and a guide to the students. Now, you can understand that the Guru would have to play this kind of multi-dimensional roles only because of the simple fact that these children were living in the Gurukul. They were not day boarding, day boarding kind of arrangement during those times. So the children were living in this setup only. We have heard stories from Ramayan where Ram and his brothers had moved to the uh, Gurukul and they stayed there for a considerable amount of time until unless they had finished their education. So Guru was expected to pay personal attention to the needs of the students. 
it was the responsibility of the guru to see that the students develops he makes progression he makes progress to the satisfaction of the guru as well as to his own satisfaction so this uh, satisfaction this self knowledge was very important during those times there used to be a very intimate relationship between the teacher and the taught almost like a father and a son teaching method was oral it was interaction based there used to be dialogues between the teacher and the taught the written education started quite long during this phase which we are talking of it was more of an oral interaction which was there between the teacher and the taught there used to be lectures there would be discourses there would be debates there would be discussions recitations would be there recapitulations would be there and all this would form a part of the student's daily routine so in daily routine life also the student would be exposed to all these kind of activities it wasn't that lectures were uh, a stipulated phase of the monthly planner or something like that that used to be a part of the daily student life now if the lectures were happening if this kind of teaching learning process was happening how was the assessment happening that seems to be a question mark or that seems to be something which arouses curiosity in us assessment was continuous it was comprehensive it was internally conducted by the guru now if you heard the term continuous if you hear the term comprehensive assessment you get immediately stuck to that continuous and comprehensive evaluation which we understood now but our gurus had been using that system for long even in the ancient india there were no terminal examinations there were no degree certificates but only announcement by the guru in the convocation that student has graduated after completion of the stipulated studies however things didn't stop here that the guru would announce that the student has studied and things would automatically flow definitely there were certain kind of arrangements which were made so that the society also gets a confidence that the student has actually got that kind of knowledge with himself so what would a guru do for the same guru would present the qualified student to a gathering of learned people who may ask questions or the student could be asked to contest in a debate and prove himself so how things would happen is one child or one learner has completed his education the guru presents him to the society he arranges for an open house session kind of thing and all the people who are there maybe the learned people or maybe the general society members they would ask questions to the student to see that whether the child has actually got that amount of scholarly knowledge or not or other way could be the student could be asked to contest in a debate and prove himself now once done that the student was acknowledged as a scholarly person the student was taken that he has completed his education under the so called guru and now he is fit to be a scholarly person the student would be then known for his mastery over the subject and accepted as a scholarly person now this autonomy of the learner was respected this was another catch point during that system that autonomy of the learner was also respected the student was free to choose the guru and the subject of studies so you had both the options you could choose your guru also yourself and you could choose your subject of study also yourself but this autonomy wasn't limited only to the student this autonomy was given even to the gurus also so guru also had a prerogative that whether you want to accept a particular student as your shishya or not if you accept it only then the student would be taken in as your shishya we all have heard where dronacharya refused karan to have him as his students because of xyz reasons point is that they were giving this prerogative that whether you want to accept that student as your uh, shishya or not this was about the education system this was about the role of teacher or the vision of guru which was envisioned by the society at that time let's move further let's talk about the different educational institutions how they got formally established the educational institutions formally got established in the form of centers for higher learning during the buddhist period in monasteries and temples so until then until the buddhist period during the ancient phase what was happening was that educational institutions were only in the form of gurukuls so only the students would be coming to the gurukuls however when we progressed to the buddhist period as things changed 
people changed societies changed and obviously the ruling dynasties changed so there the centers of higher education institutions were established in monasteries and temples these places developed into big establishments during king ashoka's time as counterpart of hindu gurukuls so it was this phase of king ashoka when monasteries were established or when temples became the centers of higher learning these were quite similar to gurukuls in certain senses and different in certain senses they became residential universities primarily they were centers of higher education they would have clusters of teachers or gurus and students who would be living and working together in pursuit of knowledge so this was similar to a gurukul but gurukul was limited to a level of knowledge these monasteries were more towards the higher education so here also the teachers and the students would be living together they would be living and working together in pursuit of knowledge education was supposed to be a pursuit of knowledge and teachers and learners both were co-partners in the same it wasn't that only the guru would be having all the knowledge and he has to transfer it to the students so it was both gurus and students who were living together who were working together in pursuit of knowledge they would engage themselves in creation conservation and dissemination of knowledge so there were three main things which were happening in these universities or uh, monasteries was creation of knowledge conservation of knowledge and dissemination of knowledge it's not possible that you create knowledge you conserve the knowledge but you do not disseminate it to the people so for knowledge to be better used knowledge to be better applied in the general day to day day life it becomes essential that knowledge is disseminated to the larger society also how did these institutions work there were three main functions of these modern universities teaching research and extension now if you look at to the role of university in the present day context even in the present day context when it comes to the functions of the university three main broad areas are teaching research and extension the similar was followed in the previous year or in the buddhist period also admissions were made through the entrance test very hard when at well known places of higher education like takshila nalanda vikramshila vallabhai nadia kanchi banaras etc so there were different centers of knowledge and the ones who were more popular or the ones who were more highly reputed had difficult entrance test quite similar to the ones which we face these days we have entrance test or some other kind of elimination rounds so that we take in certain students for higher education but we do not take all the students for higher education so during those times also there used to be entrance test for the same these centers would attract students from all over the world not just india they would have students from all over the world gurukul would continue to impart the instruction in individual capacity but not as an institution now this was one characteristic difference between a gurukul and a monastery or an institution institution would work not at an individual capacity however gurukul would work at an individual capacity there were patshalas also during the medieval period so ancient period medieval period buddhist period had similar kinds of education system also but there were things which were different also like we had patshalas during the medieval period they were maktabs for lower education and madrasas for higher education during the muslim period they were established in the mosque for imparting religious and islamic education as a part of holy quran was taught to the muslim children by the mullahs and the maulvis in these centers now this was similar to gurukuls in the sense or to the monasteries in the sense that the places of worship were used for imparting education but the kind of education which was imparted was very different gurukuls had been providing education which was a preparation of life which was for the betterment of the individual which was for the pursuit of knowledge however the education given by mullahs and maulvis that was limited to the religious education so madrasas was providing knowledge only about the quran and only to the muslim children so there was narrowness of the aim here this kind of arrangement continued till the east india company entered india and they established themselves as a controlling authority in many regions now with the advent of the east india company in the india you would realize that they were controlling authority in many regions they changed different systems 
they changed the gurukul system of education they did not accept gurukul as a formal system of education so they introduced the concept of schools colleges and universities however we need not forget whatever we have got from our past there were things which were coming to us back now through the western direction we are talking of constructivism now we are talking of continuous and comprehensive evaluation as a western concept now but as you have already heard that in the previous years in the ancient times only we were the ones who were using continuous and comprehensive evaluation so we need to respect our lineage we need to respect our history and we need to learn from those things thank you all for this session